Hi, this is Dave Danielson, and welcome to The Long View. Our guest today is Neil Levesque. Neil is the Executive Director of St. Anselm's New Hampshire Institute of Politics, and most recently has been named Chief of Staff at St. Anselm College. Welcome, Neil. Thanks for having me on, Dave. Well, welcome. And again, congratulations on your appointment um, as Chief of Staff. Well, thank you very much. Uh, St. Anselm College is uh, thriving, and I'm very excited to be in this role. Uh, we have uh, almost 2,000 students at this point, the highest quality student we've ever had accepted this year. Um, great fundraising numbers and just a wonderful student body, so I'm happy to be in this role. And I think it's a great segue to say in full disclosure that I am a graduate of St. Anselm College, and actually I'm a political science major. Uh, back in uh, 1969. 1969. Right. How many political science majors were there then? There were eight of us. Well, it's changed. We have probably close to 200 now very wow. engaged in politics. Here. Right. And a beautiful center. Beautiful yes. center for knowledge. It's great. Um, thank you for having us here today. I really do appreciate it. Thank you. Um, because I think a lot of people don't know what the New Hampshire Institute of Politics is. They hear about it, I think, on television and the newspaper whenever the primaries come around. But perhaps you could explain what is the New Hampshire Institute of Politics. Sure. I, I love this topic because, frankly, if you're a member of the New Hampshire community, um, particularly if you live nearby, this is a wonderful resource for you. So let's say that you live in Bedford and you have an interest in civics or any type of history. All of these types of programming is going on here and it's free and open to the public. So we have a 20,000 square foot facility here on the campus of St. Anselm College. We have two auditoriums. We have a full television studio. In fact, most of the television, if you turn on many of the major networks and you see someone in New Hampshire who's broadcasting live, that usually is from our building. So we have that. Um, we have a research center. We have this wonderful library of 2,800 volumes dedicated. This is the Young Library, 2,800 volumes dedicated towards uh, the presidency. And as you can see, it's a wonderful place to sit, maybe open a book and enjoy yourself. Um, so many of our uh, events are free and open to the public, and we encourage people to come. You can get online and just Google New Hampshire Institute of Politics and see all of our upcoming events. And one of the questions I did have, Neil, was the addition of the political library, which I think was probably about five years ago or so? A little bit longer than that, okay. but yes. Okay. And what value do you think it has given to the students primarily because that's its focus um, but also to other scholars who might come in? Well um, almost maybe seven or eight years ago we did bring the New Hampshire Political Library into the building into the operation um, that was started by the late governor Hugh Gregg um, he was my mentor in fact ah. uh, really the king of the New Hampshire primary he and Bill Gardner the Secretary of State uh, really wanted to have a focus on the primary and they created the library to do so. Um, we've brought it here and we've brought many of the signature activities that we do uh, with it. So let me tell you one of those things. We have a thing called the Lesser Known Candidates Forum uh, and it's, it's very interesting because if you watch, if you look at the presidential primary, you'll see on your ballot when you go to vote that there's sometimes upwards of 40 people on the ballot. But maybe there, you just saw two people on the big presidential debate stage. Yeah. Well, what about the rest of them? And they should have a chance to, to be heard by the voters as well. So we offer these, this lesser known candidates forum. It's quite popular. Uh, that's one of the things we do. We also put on our politics and eggs breakfast series yes. with the New England okay. Council, which is really New England's Chamber of Commerce. Yes. Um, that is something that is so popular. It's nationally known. Uh, it was on the show, The West Wing. Uh, and so that is the kind of thing that we do here. Um, basically, if you're running for president, uh, you're going to participate in, in one of those platforms like Politics and Eggs or the other ones that we offer here. Right. But uh, Donald Trump, for example, did Politics and Eggs twice. Hillary Clinton did Politics and Eggs. Uh, they all have done it over the years. And you've also integrated a number of the New England and New Hampshire uh, senators and congressmen uh, and con congressional candidates and senatorial candidates into that program. Absolutely. So uh, this building is really a hub for all of that activity. And it's not unusual that 
on a weekly basis or bi-weekly that a U.S. Senator could be walking down the hall or a governor, um, Senator Judd Gregg uh, has an office in the building, um, so he's here quite often. So this type of interaction is happening here with the public and with, of course, our students. Right. And what it does is it if you're if you're a student at St. Anselm College, you're you're reading, you're studying political science or politics, or you could be studying nursing. If you have an interaction with politics and understand the business of politics, uh, it's going to be very helpful. You, you know, I mentioned nursing. Probably nothing will affect a nursing major more than politics in Healthcare. the next or 20 years. That's true. So looking at the long view, uh, f no matter what you do when you're, when you're a college student, if you get some sort of a exposure to the real practical side of politics, it's going to help you with your career. Right. I think in keeping with the idea of the long view, the, um, uh, I did find an, uh, a quote from Thomas Jefferson who said that uh, an educated citizenry is a vital requisite for our survival as a free people. How does the Institute support Thomas Jefferson's statement? Well, that's a great question because, frankly, in a democracy, if you do not have citizens who understand what this country is about and how it operates and have, have an understanding of politics, lower P, um, mm -hmm. you, you, you really are going to have a problem. And as a result, um, this institute really was founded by um, the college and Senator Judd Gregg as an, a vehicle and a place where you could get that type of civic engagement and learn about your country, hear from different people in politics, and in civic life in general. But it's so important, you know, why is the next generation, 20 or 30 years from now, why are they going to vote if they don't have an understanding of how important it is? or that they matter in the electoral process, and they really do, and they can see that here with the engagement that we do here. Um, and I, I expect that that, and this was a question, but I can turn it into a, I guess, to a statement, is that seems to support the idea of the success that the Institute of Politics has had since its innovation in 1991, I think it was. Well, 2001 is when we cut the ribbon on the building. Okay. Uh, the building, by the way, has a very unique history. The college gave the land to the federal government so they could build right. an Army Reserve yep. Center here. The Crafts Building is what it's called. It's named after two brothers who died in World War II from the west side of Manchester. It's very important because today we don't forget that. And when veterans groups need a place to organize or have a meeting, this is where they can do it. Right. Um, so what happened was is that when the end of the Cold War, when the Reserve Center was no longer needed by the federal government, um, they turned it through Senator Gregg's work back to the college, and there was some money obtained to expand the building. And so in three days before September 11, 2001, the ribbon was cut which is really amazing because America changed three days later. Right, right. Um, one of the questions that I had asked you earlier, but uh, regarding the primaries, because the primaries are so important to the political process in the nation. Um, other institutes, other states, certainly are jealous of the role that the New Hampshire Institute of Politics plays in the primaries. How does the institute defend itself against those kinds of uh, opportunists? Well, I think it's the people of the state of New Hampshire that really defend it. And they do that because they have such high voter turnouts and they take their responsibility of being first in the nation seriously. Uh, they go and engage candidates and they really put them through the ringer. Um, and that is what we are charged with here. You cannot do what we do here in any other state. You really cannot. Um, big money in politics, that wants to change it. And the reason why is that it's much easier for someone who's very wealthy or some big moneyed interest to just write a check, they cut a 30 second television ad, and they run it in California over and over again. Uh, and then the candidate flies into the Los Angeles airport, gives one speech, and takes off again for more fundraisers. Well, you can't do that here. You need to interact with people. And they ask the tough questions. Sometimes candidates don't like it. 
but it's a perfect ground for really putting these candidates to the test. Now other states and other voters in those states, they don't have to do what we do. If they don't want to vote for the candidate that New Hampshire chose, that's okay. They have their, their time and their choice. But we certainly put them through a very good process uh, before they move on to other states. And you spoke of the candidates don't necessarily like to have to go through that interrogative process. The parties themselves don't necessarily like to have their candidates going through that process as well. Sure. I mean, if you're the party chairs, if you're the sort of the, the what they used to call the people in the back room, the smoky dark rooms, right. you in the back room, um, you want to be able to choose your candidate. You don't want the voters to decide because you want to choose a candidate that for some reason might help you, right? And so as a result, that is how the New Hampshire primary really came about. Was a lot of people said in, in this progressive movement, the turn of the century, they said, hey, you know, we should have the ability to go and choose candidates directly. Why is it that these um, bo party bosses get to do it? And so that's really how this primary was developed. Um, it's over 100 years old. And it's been working very well. Now, we don't always pick the winner. Um, and some people get mad when we, when we do choose a candidate. Um, but the, the point is, is that we are doing what we believe best here by putting these people through a vigorous process where they have to meet the candidates, where they have to meet the voters, and they get the tough questions. And let me put you on the spot a little bit as far as the parties in New Hampshire and the parties national. Um, Two years ago, the Republican uh, committee, state committee, chose not to bring on board the Speaker of the House, which normally would have been a member of the Executive Committee of the State Republican Party. Chose not to, to bring him on board. Um, just recently, the, the Democratic National Committee kind of snubbed, if you will, uh, Chairman Buckley of the Democratic Party. Um, one of the concerns that was discussed by some folks that I, I'm familiar with was what does that mean? What does that mean on a national basis? Does that mean the national committees are hoping that New Hampshire loses its place and that the committees don't or the the Republican and Nat Democratic parties in the state don't have the role that they've had? Do you see that as a challenge? Um, well taking that in two parts. The first is, is anytime there's divisiveness within a party structure, it could show weakness. The good thing on the Ray Buckley um, point was that another New Hampshire citizen was put into the post that he was not put into. So that showed that we still have that power. Plus he's been an effective chairman who's known nationally. Um, the second part of that is that, um, you know, the good news is, is that parties don't choose when we have the primary and why we're first. If they were able to choose, we would not have the presidential primary. Right, right. They don't want it. I think some of them think that we're sort of a pain and they don't want to put their L.L. Bean boots on and come up here in the wintertime and slog around. Right. Um, but again, that's the party bosses. The primary is, the dates are set by the New Hampshire Secretary of State. And as everyone knows, you know, in the, in the United States, states control the electoral process and uh, we've been doing a good, good job here uh, for many years under our Secretary of State. You just prompted a question that I had not prepared. Um, I remember being involved in some of the campaigns way back and I can remember the news people who covered the campaigns back then um, being very complimentary, perhaps not in, well, in a newspaper a news person's way of being complimentary about the process in New Hampshire felt very strongly that the New Hampshire process was a good process for the candidates to go through. Have you found that to be true today in the today's media? Because um, your connections with them are pretty strong, I suspect. Well, that's a great question too because um, reporters love the New Hampshire primary because it makes their job easier. And without this direct interaction, they don't get that interaction either. So traditionally, we've had a lot of fans amongst the national media. Um, what we're seeing now is that the media is sort of 
becoming much, much larger. So it's not a necessarily a New York Times uh, reporter that's up here. It could be somebody tweeting for some distant organization and they just happen to be here tweeting. So the method of delivering the news has changed. Um, what we've also seen is that we have to sort of make sure that these young reporters that are coming up who are in this new media age uh, learn about the primary and why it does benefit them in doing their job. But they're intricate to the process, they're intricate to that, and uh, they're very helpful to us. Now, I've also, <coughs> I've also seen Excuse some me. of the programs that you've offered, um, and you might want to expand on this too, on the amount of programs you do offer, but I think I've seen some of the programs you offer after hours um, is the role of new, me quote, quote, new media in the campaigns, not just national campaigns, but state and local campaigns as well. Well, that's a fascinating subject, and it's one that we have spent a lot of time on and had a lot of programming on. Um, you know, it, again, it used to be that a reporter, say, for the Manchester Union leader would come here, they'd write their story, by the end of the day they would type it up, off it would go to William Loeb Drive, be printed, and the next morning you'd get your newspaper and you'd read it. You know, nowadays, instantly, on Twitter, somebody's reporting what's happening with a candidate. And maybe, as we've seen with the president, he's tweeting back, or he's tweeting what he wants to get ahead of the story. It's absolutely fascinating because there's no time for a spin room like the old days, uh, and there's a lot more people reporting. You know, we have, as I mentioned, let's say 200 St. Anselm students that are pretty engaged in politics here. So if they're in the audience when a candidate is here, or maybe a candidate is just walking through the building, and the candidate says something, they just pick up their phone and now they're the reporter. And so it's a different kind of delivery. It's very fascinating. It makes things much, much quicker. Uh, candidates have less room for error. Um, they, you know, everywhere they go, there's someone usually recording them, maybe two to three people. Um, and they're looking for those mistakes. And there's people all around tweeting too. In truth, doesn't that make the role then of the Institute of Politics even more difficult? Because I just read a, a quote last night by Peter Nash uh, in preparation for today, uh, by Peter Nash who said everybody's an expert. And well, he, And he said the reason for that is that with very little knowledge and with the media you have today, you can become an expert. Yes, and first of all, I think Everyone who votes believes that they are an expert in politics in general. Particularly, I have a couple of uncles that believe <laughs> that they're experts in politics. Right. And it's their interpretation. The other interesting thing is, uh, we had a speaker here recently who said that it used to be that the news informed people. Now it affirms. So if you believe a certain set of values, you may turn on the news, and I do that in quotes, that will affirm your values and your beliefs. It doesn't necessarily inform you. And what I've seen in politics, which is really a shame, is that it's almost like the Red Sox versus the Yankees. Which jersey do you have on? And depending upon that, you will take the side of that person or that party uh, to the end without reviewing that maybe the facts don't actually back up what you're saying. And what candidates and politicians do now is when they dispute, if they get caught in something or they don't like the way the story is, they say it's fake news. Well, at some point there are facts. And as citizens, as voters, we need to sort of examine what are the tr what's the truth here. And sometimes that's hard to get to. News stations, again, are, are affirming, and because of that, that's the way that they're delivering this news and they're doing it in order to get the viewers and in order to raise revenues for their station, not necessarily to inform. Is that a greater challenge then for the Institute of Politics to sustain its mission to educate, uh, encourage, and empower? It is a, a greater challenge and I think the, one of the biggest challenges is saying to people when they come through the door, you got to take off, you know, your 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 game jersey, and you got to hear these people out. 
in people and politics, I think, the view is that they're rather sinister. Now, let me tell you one of the most controversial things that I say when I go out and I give speeches on this subject, which is, the truth is, is that people in politics work very hard. They are work. you can turn on C-SPAN on a Thursday night at 9 o'clock and they're on the floor of the U.S. House of Representatives working. Uh, they don't get a lot of praise, believe it or not, for what they do. And they're very patriotic people, in general, who are working hard to do what's best for all of us. That is one of the most controversial things because the American view is that people in politics or elected officials are sinister, they're doing things for their own gain, and they're not good. And, and nothing could be further from the truth. Remember, I see both sides. I spent a lot of time with Donald Trump and I spent a lot of time with Bernie Sanders and Hillary Clinton. They're not sinister people and they're trying to do what they believe is right for the country. And a lot of people don't think when they go online at, or go on television at night and, and see those folks speaking in the House or the Senate, I think don't realize the amount of work that's being done behind those scenes. I mean, that's the public work. Uh, what they're doing, a lot of the committee work that they're doing, a lot of one-on-one -on -one work that people don't see, I think is another thing that people don't take. And quite frankly, I'll give tribute again to the to some of the folks who have graduated from the institute and from the college, the New Hampshire State House is well populated with graduates from the institute and from the this college, all helping the elected officials that are in place as lobbyists in some cases or as state employees in other cases. Yes, we have a lot of graduates both here in New Hampshire and Concord and on Capitol Hill in Washington. Right. Uh, it's great when you need a meeting <laughs> and they're right. your former student. Right. Um, the truth is, is that um, a lot of people don't see, you're right, that the work that they do, there's a lot of misconceptions about elected officials. I'll just say Congress to begin with. There's this internet thing that if you're elected to Congress, you have a million dollar retirement fund, slush fund, you, you know, don't have to pay for this, that, and the other thing. Um, Actually, nothing could be further from the truth. You're a federal employee when you're a member of Congress. There's some slight exceptions to that. Uh, you put money into your retirement. You get a health care benefit just like everybody else, and you pay a portion of that. Um, most people do not realize that. They get paid, let's say, $180,000, which is a lot more than average citizen in New Hampshire. However, remember that you've got to maintain your household here in New Hampshire. You need to maintain a household in Washington, which is not easy. It's very expensive. A little apartment can be very, right. very expensive. A lot of members of Congress sleep in their offices in Washington, D.C. A lot of people don't realize that because they, frankly, and I know <laughs> this is taking it to extreme, but it's too expensive to live near Capitol Hill. So it's not bad. $180,000 a year is good, but uh, it's not exactly um, the road to riches here at all times. Students, high school students, uh, junior college students who are looking forward to perhaps getting into a uh, government work or getting into political political uh, um, situations have a number of institutes of politics that they can look at. Certainly Harvard's, one of, I guess our first director uh, left here and went to Harvard uh, as the director down there for their institute. How do we differentiate, we, the Inst New Hampshire Institute of Politics, how do we differentiate ourselves from other institutes of politics? Sure, there are a few institutes uh, across the country, the University of Chicago, Harvard, as you mentioned, Georgetown. Uh, but this is really unique for an institution like St. Anselm College. Mm -hmm. There is nothing like this in our contemporary schools. Um, Except, of course, if you go to Harvard. Now, Harvard gets its fair and wonderful set of speakers. But a lot of the times, those Harvard fellows come up here to speak. And we partner with the Harvard Institute of Politics quite a bit. We get more of the presidential focus, um, uh, which is good sometimes. And they get more to the day-to-day -day focus, mayors and things like that, on a day-to-day -day basis. Mm -hmm. uh, we do do a lot of things with them. Um, you, asked, you asked about students. What it does is that it shows you as a student how to be a professional around politicians, 
what it's like to be in the real practical side of politics. You know, I come from a family of dentists. I'm the only one who's not a dentist going back to my grandfather, all my uncles, father, sisters and brothers, everybody. When I came out of college um, majoring in political science, my father had no idea what I was going to do for work. Um, but the truth is, is that the business side of politics is very much alive and well. And, and anyone can just turn on right now any of the news stations and see CNN, Fox, all of these things that are going on in politics. Um, but there's all different aspects. You've got the public policy side, the historic side. You've got the practical campaign side, the media side, putting together television commercials, for example. All of the communication side. Really, the way I look at it is, if you had a triangle, politics is really at the top of the professional level. Mm -hmm. um, and a lot of people who get into politics because of their interaction will then go into business very seamlessly or back through. So it's a great place to be professionally. Um, and uh, you, know, you don't just have to be a staffer. There's plenty of other opportunities. What opportunities do you see for the New Hampshire Institute of Politics looking out now 20 or 30 years, which is our focus, to look like 20 or 30 years? What do you see as the opportunities for the Institute of Politics? Well, I believe that we'll still have the presidential primary by then. Um, and I believe that St. Anselm College will be thriving just as it is today. So I think that the Institute really, I think, is, is going to continue to be a hub for this type of interaction. Now, of course, Anyone can pick up their iPad and get a YouTube video of a speaker. But there's something very different about coming into an auditorium here, seeing that speaker up close and personal, raising your hand and asking a question, having a direct interaction. You just can't get that kind of thing by watching YouTube. Uh, it's a very different thing. And, you know, the truth is because we're centrally located here on the edge of Manchester and Goffstown, um, it's, it's so easy for citizens to travel less than an hour to get here and, uh, and participate. And to attest to what you said, uh, I remember talking to a woman who had just moved here. Actually, she had moved here, I think, from New Jersey. And she had just gone to a, a house party where she met a, Dem a Democratic candidate. And she said, oh, I never would have been able to meet these people in, back when I was at home in New Jersey. She said, it's incredible that I can meet all of these people. Indeed, when Senator Sununu was living in Bedford, you could see him down at Dunkin' Donuts having a cup of coffee in the morning, you know, where you could meet these people and talk to them and ask them these questions. And again, the Institute appears to give that kind of support as well. Yes, I think that we have more presidential campaign activity in this building than any other building in the United States. Now, it's hard to gauge that. I think the White House probably beats us sometimes, but uh, the truth is is that uh, not just with presidential candidates. I mean, Senator Shaheen, uh, Senator Hassan, they're here all the time. Um, that is something, the interaction just talking to a U.S. Senator is not something you can do in California or New Jersey or Texas. People go a whole lifetime and not meet them, not meet who represents them. That's not the way it is here in New Hampshire and especially here at the Institute of Politics. This is a question of personal interest. Uh, you mentioned the, uh, the New England Council. Um, I was active in the New England Association of Regional Councils and so I'm very interested in regionalism, if you will. And how do you see the region benefiting, if you can, from the re and by region I mean the New England, six state New England region. How do you see it benefiting from something like the New Hampshire Institute of Politics? That's another great question. So people ask me, what is the biggest audience that you have here at the Institute? Now, obviously, we have students from St. Anselm College. That would be the biggest. But I would say number two are business people from New England. We have a lot of people that get in their cars in Rhode Island and Boston and other places and drive up here for our programming. Why is that? Well, you can't meet these people and talk to these people in any other place like you can here. Now, if you're running a business, one of the things that you want most from government is to just know, as you say, the long view. 
what's the long view here? What policies are going to affect me in 10 years so that I can plan this for my customers and for my bottom line? Um, and if, if they're around these people in an atmosphere like this, they'll get answers to those questions. And then maybe they can press them as well. Um, the point is, is that um, public policy affects these people in business so directly that um, they need to be around this kind of activity. And as a result, we get people, I, I have a lot of people, particularly from the Boston area, that are coming up here and with the New England Council and other organizations. Right. And certainly St. Anselm's alumni um, is very strong in the greater Boston area and um, actually the New England area is pretty strong. Yeah. So you can get a lot of that interplay as well. Yeah, you know, a lot of people in New Hampshire probably don't know the whole story about St. Anselm. And it's such a vibrant college. This is a, this is a tough school to get into. St. C's. There you go, yes. Saint and C's. it's a tough school right. to get through. Um, the good thing is, is that we have students that go on to, say, graduate school or law school, and they come back and they say, well, actually, it's easier than St. Anselm. St. Anselm <coughs> is a tough place. Excuse me. And really, uh, the core of it is liberal arts. Um, and we have a lot of different programming here, and it's a very vibrant campus. Um, and we're doing very, very well. Um, the, the Catholic Benedictine education here is uh, second to none. Uh, we have 23 monks that really are, I hate to say it, but the glue that keep everybody together as a community. They're really, they're all around campus um, and they really um, form our faith here. Uh, and it's a special place. Uh, and so, you know, a lot of times if you drive by and you see a big gate and it says St. Anselm College, you, you may not want to drive in. But the truth is, is we want you to drive in. It's a welcoming place, uh, and it's a real sense of community once you're on campus. And again, in tribute to one of the founders, um, one of the people who was very active in bringing about the New Hampshire Institute of Politics, Father Jonathan DeFelice, member of the class of 69. <laughs> 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 I had to bring that up. Um, but, uh, and also from Rhode Island. Um, he was a monk from, who originally grew up in Rhode Island. Yes, so, and he's serving down in Rhode Island right now for the uh -huh. diocese down there. Uh, he is a member of the St. Anselm Benedictine community. Mm -hmm. um, Father Jonathan is from Bristol, Rhode Island, which is, of course, where the many a sailboat fan knows what comes out of Bristol, Rhode Island. And Father Jonathan, I always said, you must have grown up sailing so much. And he said, I hate boats, and I never went on the thing. But he loves politics. <laughs> he does. And that really benefited us here at St. Anselm. Right. Neil, uh, as somebody who is viewing the long view right now, what can you say to them that would inspire them to come here to see some of the programming? If you have, just take a couple of moments if you can and let them know. Well, I think, you know, as you go through your day and you're turning on the television and you're sort of curious about certain things in politics and, and you really want the answers to that, why is this happening, why is this group doing this, uh, this is where you're going to find those answers. And a lot of the times, the people that say is on, uh, that are on your television set are here in this building. And, you know, you are a citizen. And you have a right to, to get answers and to have your questions answered. And uh, this is the place to do it. And it's a really wonderful place. I mean, you can see from this room, 2,800 volumes dedicated to the presidency. I mean, my biggest challenge is walking by this room every day and not said, walking yeah. in and picking out a book and just sort of getting into right. it. <laughs> right, right. I think um, I know my classmates when we came, came back for a reunion, uh, as you walk down the hallways here, the, the number of photographs that are up from a long way back, I think actually into our, our time, um, are here uh, that people can take a look at and uh, remember um, remember when. The building really is set up as almost uh, an interpretive center for the primary. Um, so uh, John F. Kennedy was here in the 60s, right. campaigned quite a bit here right. on campus and in Manchester. There's a lot of pictures devoted to him and all the other candidates going through. You can see a lot of what our students have done, particularly with the presidential debates. Remember that many of the presidential debates have taken, here, taken place here. Uh, we had the only two sanctioned 
debates uh, on our campus last in the last primary. Right. Uh, and uh, so those pictures are here. Um, and it's really a, a, a wonderful site. We have a podium that John F. Kennedy spoke from uh, in Manchester on Election Day 1960. Uh, we have that in the building. We have the speech that he delivered before he got in the car and drove to Boston and voted and then went off to Cape Cod to await returns. <coughs> so this is the kind of thing that we have here. If many, many people may remember the uh, 1980 Reagan-Bush debate at Nashua High School, um, when Reagan got done with that debate, he went to the Holiday Inn here in Manchester and he picked up a Holiday Inn glass and, and toasted with some champagne to his debate performance. Um, we have a person that grabbed that exact glass, all the memorabilia with the debate, uh, and who has graciously uh, turned it over to the Institute, so that's here in the building. Uh, there's a lot of wonderful things. Um, just in the recent, say, six months, many of the books that have been written about the, the last election, um, we figure prominently in the books, um, and so we have those on display as well. In uh, 1968, President, or Governor Nixon, uh, Governor Nixon came to campus and uh, gave a presentation. Um, he needed some chauffeurs to move he and his entourage around Manchester. All of the chauffeurs were students from St. Anselm. Really? Well, yes. I didn't know that story. Yep. Um, Richard Nixon did come here and um, one morning, uh, not too long ago, I had gotten up very early uh, on a Saturday morning, I turned on C-SPAN and they had some historic coverage of the primary and they were showing coverage here at St. Anselm. So you were probably at that event. Probably. And they showed uh, Patrick Buchanan who looked like he was a, the age of a college <coughs> student. They were interviewing him in this clip as well. So that was, uh, that was a special morning. I, I couldn't believe it. Another thing, um, and this is again a personal question I guess, is that uh, what we used to do was I remember Emile Boussier, who ran for governor, and Walter Peterson, um, wanted to get out through the radio. And they came here and asked St. Anselm students if they would be interviewers for them in a radio station. WFEA at the time, an AM station, um, brought the political science department in every week, different students, mixed different students up, to do a question and answer really? of all the candidates back then senatorial candidates, gubernatorial candidates. It was, um, so even back then, St. Anselm has played a role in some of the local politics. So we have a program here. Uh, the students have to apply for it and they have to make the grade. Uh, it's called our Student Ambassador Program. There's over 100 student ambassadors. They, inter they uh, introduce all of our speakers. Uh, they really run this place. I get the credit for it. Uh, but it really gets them exposed to politics at a ground level. Do you have um, sponsorship or responsibility for that program for high school kids in the summer as well? Uh, no, we don't run that program right now, um, but we offer a lot of high schools, we, have, uh, we either go out to them to speak or we bring them in. Uh, this is very popular during the presidential primary sure. period or actually in, in off-year elections as well. Um, the uh, kids voting program that we do here helps to educate a lot of young people. Uh, that's very popular. Um, but we also do th other civic events. Uh, if you've ever seen the Grand State Debates, which is a joint program with the Union Leader and yes. WMUR-TV, those Grand State Debates are actually filmed in this building as well. I want to thank you for having us here today. I mean, I have, as an alum, uh, I've enjoyed, and as a person who enjoys politics, I've enjoyed being here and I've enjoyed your conversation with us on The Long View. Thanks very much for having us. Thank you, Dave. Appreciate it very thank much. You. And thank you for participating in The Long View. Um, I hope you'll join us again the next time, but thank you for being here with Neil Levesque in the New Hampshire Institute of Politics. Take care. <laughs>